And hello, everyone. Welcome to our council meeting of Tuesday, February 2nd, evening session only. Before uh, we call the meeting to order, we certainly want to welcome you. Thank you for the privilege of your time. And I'm going to ask our engaging assistant city manager, Nat Rojanasathera, to explain how you may participate in our meeting. So Nat, take it away, please. There are two ways to participate in city council meetings. One is by joining directly on ZoomGov using the Zoom app on your computer or mobile device. And the second method is to join directly by calling into the meeting on your telephone. To join on your computer, smartphone, or telephone, please use. Does that sound bait to anybody else? I'm sorry. You sound very yeah. bait. Like it's very hard to hear you. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, let me. Let's. Uh... What'd you say, Tyler? I couldn't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Bluetooth net. It is. is. Can you hear me? Is this better? Or yeah, you... that's better. Okay. I'm Good. sorry. Okay. Thanks, Tyler. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, so there are two ways to participate in meetings. One is directly uh, using ZoomGov on the app or mobile device, and the second is to uh, call into the meeting. To join on Zoom, please check out the link and the phone number that's listed on the agenda, and you'll find that on isearchmonterey.org. To join by telephone, you can dial toll free 833 568 8864, and then the meeting ID. You can enter is 160-772-9333 pound. And if you're prompted to enter a participant ID, then you can press pound one more time. Detailed instructions on how to use Zoom is on our website at monterey.org forward slash public meetings. To make a public comment using the Zoom app, you can virtually raise your hand by clicking on the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you've dialed in by phone, please raise your hand by dialing star nine and then unmute yourself by dialing star six. Public commenters will be muted until it's their turn to speak. I'll be calling on each speaker in the order of their hands raised. We ask that you please stay within the three minute time limit established for today's meeting, which we will be showing on a countdown timer on the screen. If you're connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. This meeting is also being streamed live on youtube.com forward slash city of Monterey with a 10 second delay. And also on Comcast channel 25 that has a delay that may last up to 90 seconds. As always, we look forward to receiving public comment tonight. Thank you. While you have the floor, Nat, would you prepare the flag, please, so we can all join in the pledge in a moment? Okay, absolutely. And I think uh, our city clerk, Clementine, will be sharing the flag for us. Oh, there it is. That's our traditional flag. So if you'll all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, I appreciate that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to ask our essential city clerk, Clementine, to introduce our caring city council, please. Yes, that's, that's a good idea. My privilege. Council member Albert. Here. Council member Hoffa. Yeah. I think you're muted, council member Hoffa, but I, I see you there. I'm, I'm back. I lost my connection. Oh, so, sorry. Yep, yeah, I am present. Councilmember Smith? Uh, I'm here. Councilmember Williamson? Here. And Mayor Clyde? Yes, and I'm happy to be here with everyone. So the first, the next item on our agenda is public comments, and that allows you, the public, to speak for a maximum of three minutes on any subject within the jurisdiction of the Monterey City Council, which is not on the agenda. Anyone trying want to bring an item to the attention of the council can do it during public comments, or we suggest that you can also write a letter to the city clerk at City Hall, Monterey, California, or go to Monterey Suggest at Monterey.org. And the appropriate staff person will contact you if you need some follow-up. 
So with that, we'll turn it back to Nat to find out if we do have any general public comments, please. We do, and our first caller is area code 831 with the last three digits is 705. And we do ask that they unmute themselves by dialing star six. Please dial star six and there we go. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Mayor Robertson and city council members, Lorna Moffat here. I wish to update you on the status of the Monarch Garden and Monarch Shaplaskett Creek in Big Sur, one of the last little holdouts for the Monarchs. Our garden was killed off by the drought and smoke this last summer, and we can only hope that some milkweed plants and seeds have found somewhere to grow from that effort. The Los Padres National Forest final EIA concludes, EIS, excuse me, concludes that no significant harm will come from their spraying Roundup and other toxic weed killers 100 feet away from Plaska Creek where milkweed still grows. Kevin Elliott, the forest supervisor, in my humble opinion, is in complete denial of the harm these chemicals impart to vegetation, insects, animals, and birds alike. It doesn't matter how much scientific evidence I and others have given him in the draft EIS that these chemicals are disastrous to all species of life, including ourselves. He is in total denial. I brought up the fact that Roundup has been clocked in Denmark to drift up to 70 kilometers in five mile per hour winds. And his answer is the winds in Big Sur are different, whatever that means. I pointed out that he has, to his aid that winds are winds and they carry droplets of these various chemical poisons onto plants, trees, and all life within many ranges depending on wind dispersal. So they will spray, spray Plaska Creek, giving a 100-foot buffer zone and allowing for a 10-mile-per-hour wind drift. If any hibernating monarchs are at Plaska, great harm can and will happen. How these people are allowed to manage our forest is beyond me. They're giving our tax dollars to these chemical companies to eliminate and poison nature through ignorance and denial. I've asked Congressman Panetta to ensure that his monarch legislation passes, if it does, and millions of the tax dollars go towards that effort, that Los Padres cannot grab that money, giving the excuse they are saving milkweed from invasive species, which is what they are saying. Uh, Secretary Vilasak, <clears throat> unfortunately, is a friend of the giant chemical companies, in my opinion, would be a, all too willing to hand over such funding for this project. And so I ask you to please do your part and to protect Plaska Creek and Milkweed from the Los Padres assault, however creative way you can. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Moffitt. Let's see if we have any other callers. And we do not have any other callers for items not on today's agenda. Okay, thank you. As always, we appreciate public comment and hello to Lorna. So uh, we'll go to the consent items. We only have four consent items. Any council questions? Mayor, um, I, just have a, I just have a comment on number three. Why don't you go oh, ahead, please, Council Member Dan. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment that I, I didn't realize uh, that um, we offered fire service to uh, Palm since 1956. And that partnership mm -hmm. uh, is obviously very important to our city. And um, I, I just wanted to mention how important uh, the military is to our community. And, and I look forward to continuing that partnership, not only um, with, uh, with uh, the, the military, but also um, with the fire. So uh, I just wanted to bring that up real quickly. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Any, uh, any comments from the public or anything that we know that's been Requested to be pulled, that? No request to be pulled and no raised hands for items on consent currently. All right, then I'll just make a motion to approve the consent. Do we have a second? A second. second. Okay, thank you. Roll call, please, Clementine. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Councilmember Williamson? Yes. Councilmember Hoffa? Yep. Councilmember Albert? Yes. And Mayor Roberson? And it's a yes for me as well, so that passes 5-0. And let's go to uh, our one item on the agenda, which is a, a extremely important. And I know of, of interest uh, locally, statewide, nationally, and worldwide. And that is to adopt 
the city of Monterey adapting a threatened transportation network to sea level rise resolution, which was funded by a Caltrans planning grant. I think this has appeared in front of the planning commission as well and has had some good publicity and comments. So with that, I'll turn it over to the erudite city manager, Hans Usler. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I can promise you that over the course of the next 30 minutes, you will hear a total of three different accents uh, coming from three different speakers from three different continents <clears throat> that will tell you um, a little bit about the, uh, uh, not a, little, a lot about sea level rise. Um, if I speak for my own continent, I came from, um, uh, I, was, uh, I grew up, as, as some of you may know, on a very small island in the North Sea and protection of our <clears throat> land and our beaches was, was a primary concern for us. Uh, however, we had to protect it from, <clears throat> from the weather at that time when I grew up because uh, sea level rise was not really a topic in those, in those early years. And uh, so um, this topic is, is very close and uh, dear to my heart because um, growing up uh, with uh, 300 feet away or 300 yards away from, from the beach, uh, it, it makes you uh, very much realize uh, how strong uh, the, the, the sea can be and that, that your homes are threatened. Now today we are threatened by here in Monterey by, by sea level rise. It's, it's not uh, so much the, the rising winter storms, uh, they are just a symbolic element that, that uh, uh, show us also how strong now the sea level rise is uh, because the, the storms become more powerful. But more importantly for us, uh, when, when you look at our coastline and, and the presentations will outline that in greater detail, uh, are threats to, to our homes, uh, there are threats to our infrastructure, uh, threats to our economy. And uh, what, what you have in front of you tonight is a culmination of uh, a grant that we have received to uh, adjust our transportation to adapt to sea level rise. And um, again, uh, this, this will be uh, for you tonight, uh, something that you have already heard to a certain degree, but I'm very sure that there will be fascinating graphics and slides that, that show you really highlight that climate change is real and uh, that one way or another, we have to face, face it and also start uh, thinking about how are we going one day to react and more importantly, also how do we finance all of that? Uh, so tonight, uh, it's, it's my real pleasure to, to directly uh, lead off to Fernanda. And uh, Fernanda is, is the project manager. She um, uh, helped us to get the grant and she is, uh, has managed uh, this project uh, starting uh, in the early days with the first public outreach meeting. I believe it was virtually actually in May 2020. So with that, uh, Fernanda, take it away and um, also feel free to introduce the other players from the other continent. Thank you. Thank you, Hans, for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Fernanda Roveri. I'm with the planning office. And I'd just like to say that this is a very exciting opportunity for the city. We are definitely leading the charge in California in doing this type of transportation focused study to adapt to sea level rise. And I, I know that parallel to us, the city of Santa Cruz is also doing a similar study for their West Cliff Drive. So this area, the central coast is definitely leading the charge and, and, as, um, and the city is being very progressive doing this. Like Hans mentioned, the city of Monterey back in 2018 applied for and received a $212,472 grant from Caltrans to study the effects of sea level rise on the city's transportation network and develop transportation adjustments. And then the required local match was paid with city staff time. And by way of an RFP process, the city hired Kimley Horn and Associates and GEI consultants to, develop, to help develop the study. And so I'd just like to point out one Little fact, according to FEMA, every $1 spent on natural hazard mitigation reduces related future costs by an average of $6. So by adopting this study, the city is in a better position to tackle the challenges of sea level rise later on. 
Um, the city conducted various outreach efforts, including stakeholder meeting and two virtual community workshops to gather input about sea level rise and flooding and identify potential impacts and their timing, identify and rank adaptation strategies and transportation alternatives through an online survey, and inform the development of conceptual plans and preliminary cost estimates for a flood protection scenario versus a managed retreat scenario. And to these meetings, we invited all neighborhood and business associations, city boards, commissions and committees, and local and regional stakeholders. In addition, we mailed notices to more than 600 properties in the coastal zone prior to every community workshop. So without further ado, I'd like to now introduce our consultant team who will be presenting all the work we've done so far and the final plan. So I'm going to start the presentation now. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it over to our consultant team, Frederick and Rebecca. You may start. Thank you, Fernanda. If you would just advance the slides once. Uh, I'll be presenting tonight. Uh, I'm Rebecca Verdi with GEI Consultants, and I'm consulting with the, the project manager, Frederick Venter from Kimley Horn and Associates. Next slide, please. So the project goals are really to understand what the community risks are from the road flooding that Monterey had previously identified. From those risks, identify community priorities and propose conceptual solutions to reduce risk for each of those priorities and uh, identify funding options for next steps, all in advance of meeting the main question, how do we keep Monterey moving in the face of sea level rise over time? So we're gonna start by showing you what you've already seen from a previous consultant, the flood predictions, if you'll move forward. This first slide shows you the temporary storm flooding, not sea level rise at all. In green, you'll see the level of flooding that would happen tomorrow if a once in a century coastal storm would, were to hit. And then in blue, additional flooding if a, uh, twice, a twice an eon or once every 500 year coastal storm could hit. So when I talk about sea level rise, I am also talking about not just future, but large storms right now. Advance please. So this shows you permanent sea level rise at less than a foot, 0.7 feet, and the flooding that would happen. You'll see the arrow points to downtown because that's the first major road that floods. Advancing forward, 2.4 feet, there's another arrow up by Cannery Row, and the arrow around the downtown has gotten larger. Cannery Row, I want to be very clear, does not itself flood directly from sea level rise at 2.4 feet, which is about a mid-century prediction, but waves from a large storm could reach the road. So the Cannery Road, that's wave impacts. Downtown, that area is permanently underwater at, at all tide levels. Advance, please. And here at 5.2 feet of sea level rise or end of century, we're looking at the Highway 1 off-ramp flooding, a much larger area of downtown, the Coast Guard Pier, Access Road as well. So those were the areas we needed to look at. Advance, please. Frederick's going to jump in and talk about the consequences if we do not act. So the first slide here <clears throat> shows you the top picture of what's happening in Miami, um, you know, if we have storms and they don't get their pumps running. Um, I can share with you the moment the rain, the rain cl clouds gather over Miami, they turn their pumps on. And this is something that Miami is very used to. The bottom photo shows you at 2.4 feet of sea level rise that the water level, the sea level rise will actually touch the soffit of the lighthouse tunnel. Next slide, please. So to assess the, the this flooding that uh, Rebecca showed you on the transportation system, we looked at what roads uh, would be closed and how 
access and how would traffic would be, be diverted uh, throughout the city. So we basically took the handbag model, closed off the roads and say, hey model, we have origins and destinations. So in the morning people come in, they wanna to travel to their jobs, tourists want to travel to the hotels. Um, how do they travel to, to their destinations of work and out in the afternoon? So the, with 0.7 feet of sea level rise, we lose Del Monte, it's 57,000 daily trips. Um, what the model tells us about 12,600 will divert to Pearl Street and 11,000 to Fremont Street. The other vehicles distribute throughout the system. Um, you know, you can see the red boxes are where we see more traffic diverting to as people want to commute between Highway 1, downtown Canary Row and Pacific Road. Next slide, please. So then with 2.4 feet of sea level rise, Pearl Street also floods. So we lose two streets. And then traffic onto Fremont uh, Street um, is the addition there is about 21,000 vehicles. And then we see even more traffic going onto the other streets. Um, the, as the traffic diverts to other streets, we see, see gridlock in downtown, um, you know, and we'll, we're going to see every interchange having um, increases um, trying to, where people try to get off the, off the freeway, off Highway 1 and go into town. Next slide, please. So with 5.2 feet of sea level rise, we use the three main arterials um, into the city. So this has such a detrimental impact on commute between Highway 1 and downtown and Canary Row and Pacific Grove that the model cannot find a way for people to actually commute between those two uh, destinations. And the model tells us there's a reduction in traffic. So what this is, this results in this economic impact where people cannot get to their jobs anymore, people cannot get to the hotels, people cannot go work. Um, so a serious concern for, for the, for the long-term future conditions. Next slide, please. Uh, these are photos that some of you may know, but you know, the impact on the transportation in infrastructure system goes wider than just water over the road. Um, you know, the top left picture shows uh, Del Monte that was flooded in 1987 when I think some of the pumps failed. Um, you know, sinkholes form underneath the streets uh, from our stormwater systems. So the sea, sea level rise intrusion go and erode the, 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 the ground underneath the streets. This is actually a picture that was taken on North Fremont Street during the, um, during the construction there. And the actually sinkholes were discovered underneath the street. The freeways flood. Um, the wreck trail, uh, another picture of wreck trail that was flooded um, in the past. And then all the transportation infrastructure that supports the movement of traffic signals, your cabling, your uh, controller boxes, your street lighting um, will all fail as part of the flooding. Next slide, please. So when we have the loss of roadways, there is this cascading effect on the way that we live in Monterey. And this graphic gets very busy. But you will see that it really focuses and shows us that impact of business, the impact to our community, the impact to closure um, of, of, of businesses, food and shelter, and ultimately our quality of life. Next slide, please. So Rebecca's going to talk about the solutions. Thanks, Frederick. We looked at adaptation for four main areas. But because we've got limited time tonight, I'm going to focus only on the downtown. And I, I would hope that you get a chance to, to read the study, to look at the solutions proposed for areas one, three, and four. We tried to make that study really readable. So we hope that'll be easy. Um, and we have several options for each of the areas. But specifically, uh, area number two, downtown, if we advance forward, we have two buckets of solutions. On the left, various options for flood barriers meant to keep the seas out. And on the right, the option of allowing the sea in in a controlled manner and adapting a new transportation network so we can keep people uh, moving around. So let's talk about the first. Um, we costed out two different types of seawalls that would run along the existing uh, Monterey Recreational Trail for a little less than a mile. So uh, click please. These are those two seawalls. On the left, uh, we've raised up the coastal trail about 13 feet and we've put significant amounts of wave armoring 
on the outside in a way that would reduce the size of large storm waves as they hit the wall. So that wall is about 13 feet. That should handle a 100-year storm to, to the end of century, 2100, um, or a little over five feet of sea level rise. And the cost of that one is about 60 million. A different design leaves the coastal trail right where it is, same elevation, and does a very narrow wall with a smaller footprint. Because uh, of the lesser amount of armoring, you need a higher wall. So that's a 17 foot wall for about 90 million. Now, both of these walls assume you build a wall that will last to the end of century in the near term future. Another way of doing a seawall would to be to build it in increments as needed, but that would that would require a different level of design. Move forward, please. Another option for downtown is a levee, taking over the existing beach and park right in front of El Estero. And that could be a more narrow sort of traditional levee that's barren, or it could be what we've shown here, an ecotone levee or a naturally planted levee, which is much wider and is uh, planted to resemble the natural environment. So the, another option for downtown. Next, please. I do want to point out because the obvious answer to sea level rise is build a barrier. So always look at what's behind an obvious answer. There are some, some constraints to that. So we live in California, it's a seismically active state, and there are health and safety concerns with living behind a seawall or any flood protection barrier in a seismically active um, area. Quality of life. Uh, is a concern when we no longer have access to our coast or limit access to our coast. And then interior flooding is a significant concern because you've got both rainwater that gets caught behind that barrier, but you also have rising groundwater and you have the ocean itself back flowing through the current gravity drains of the storm sewer system, all of which would need additional engineering to work out. Next, please. So the alternative is to reimagine Monterey entirely. And that's a, that's a planned retreat scenario. And because this one obviously has uh, huge concerns. Oh, well, we're, we're losing land. It would cost a lot to build uh, new transportation. We then show you what some of the advantages could be. So Monterey is unique among all of the California coastal cities I've looked at for sea level rise in that you've got a geography that allows for a very specific planned retreat. You're not losing a huge linear coastline. There's a small low spot downtown. And so retreat allows you to actually add, in this case, about two miles of new coastline, which adds opportunities for coastal recreation, coastal shopping and dining adds the opportunity to do ecosystem rec restoration um, and new aquatic recreation. So there's, there's economic opportunities that Monterey has from a retreat plan that almost no other city in the state has. And I, I think that's kind of amazing. Next slide, please. So Frederick's gonna jump back in and talk about specific traffic adjustments if we were to go in that direction. So what we're presenting here are some options for um, dealing with the traffic. Um, next slide, please. So the first alternative is to convert Del Monte into a bridge or a viaduct that would cross the beach. Next slide, please. It would basically start at Sloats and, and, and end about where the tunnel is, above, not in the tunnel, but above ground. Um, so this can be constructed as a two-lane facility, um, plus then, of course, the, the Monterey Bay Scenic Trail, um, and, and, and sidewalks. Um, the cost of this kind of structure is estimated about $350 million. A big element of the cost is also utilities. Del Monte is a, is a major carrier of the city's utilities. Those would also need to be relocated and, and installed in this bridge structure. Next option shows you a four-lane alternative um, where we would then have vehicles, transit, and again, the, the Monterey Bay Scenic Trail, and pedestrian activities, the cost goes up to about $482 million. So those are the two options for the bridge. The next one is that we have an option for uh, Pearl Street. 
Um, so the, the alignments that we have is running along Del Monte, coming up slope, and then um, you know, going down, down Third and Park and then crossing these two bridges. Uh, they would, um, you know, there would be improvements there and then heading into downtown. Next slide, please. So Sloat Avenue would be widened. Well, actually, the parking would just be eliminated. Um, class one bike path would be constructed and turned into four lanes. And then once we hit Third Street and we get to Pearl Street, we're going to optimize using the existing um, roadway that say eliminate some parking and use what we call intelligent transportation systems, where we manage the usage of the lanes in the morning. So in the morning, um, we would have two lanes inbound towards downtown and one lane outbound. And then in the afternoon, we would flip this around. So vehicles, primarily the, the, the main demand is outbound uh, from downtown towards Highway 1. We would just use the signage to, to optimize lane usage. Uh, this is a cool um, uh, tool to use and not buy extensive property and not really build a lot of lanes that we may not need. Cost of this alternative is about $104 million. Next slide. Another option that we looked at was the, what we call the alternative Del Monte alignment, uh, very radical. And that is to try and maintain the four lanes up to uh, the, the bridge where we get to Pearl Street, but that would destroy the neighborhood. Uh, we would need to buy property um, and also then uh, get the street um, along that alignment. Um, the Monterey Bay Scenic Trail, of course, could remain along the beach and then cross where at Pearl Street. Next slide, please. So basically the cross section where we know now as it is four lanes on Del Monte, um, have the class one bike path and then once again the managed lanes uh, once we reach the Pearl Street. Cost of this is about 128 million. The third alternative that we have and the, the whole setup here was to give you various alternatives to pick and choose from. By no means are we saying do this one or do that one, but that's to optimize Fremont Street. Um, you know, improve it to be a full six lane facility with a transit lane in the median. Um, in the analysis that uh, is covered in the report, we have a heavy, heavy reliance on transit mobility. I think we're trying to ask for like a 20% usage of transit facilities. So providing that transit priority in the median um, for the buses is gonna be very important. So the improvements along Fremont um, is about $34.5 million. Um, uh, Fernanda mentioned that we did a community survey uh, back in May and June last year. I'm going to show you just a couple of highlights from that. There's very a lot of real cool, great detail in the traffic study uh, in, and, and in the adaptation report. So the bulk of the community said managed retreat is a option, a preferred option. Why? Because of safety and also the quality of life that would be maintained. Um, the about a quarter of the people did prefer the flood barriers instead. Next slide. So the the question what that we posed to people was what what would you prefer in terms of how do we move people in and out of Monterey? And uh, you know, approximately two thirds said multimodal improvement. So not just bike and walk, but transit. A heavy move towards transit, um, getting people from um, Highway One into downtown Canary Row and to Pacific Grove. Next slide, please. Fernanda, oh, sorry, Rebecca. Um, so just to, to wrap up with our recommendations, we do recommend that the city look as soon as possible at, at temporary flood barriers. And we've provided the city with some uh, information about commercially available, deployable flood barriers, things you can just put out um, ahead of a large coastal storm. We're looking at, uh, about a thousand linear feet to protect against a large amount of flooding from a hundred year storm. Those same temporary barriers could be used if seas rise faster than predicted, which there's no current indication they are, but could be used uh, to buy the city some time as it's making decisions for longer term strategies. Next slide, please. So now look at those temporary flood protection measures 
and then apply for grants because you're going to need more information to build on this study before you make a final decision about the direction for the city. So um, Fernanda has applied for $400,000 uh, worth of grants from FEMA. The Office of Emergency Services has been helping and the State Coastal Conservancy has pledged significant matching funds and they're very excited about working with the city. And then we also recommend continuing with the beach nourishment just to stay on top of erosion and, and uh, do the best we can as we're buying time to make some decisions. In next, please. In the next few years, uh, there are a number of studies that uh, I just referenced for those grants that would help the city make some cost-based, fact-based decisions about what direction to go in. And we highly, highly recommend building partnerships, not just with the entities you're already working with within the city and the region, but with additional entities wherever possible, because FEMA funds are really dependent on having strong partnerships, whether those are um, just support or matching in kind funds, um, but FEMA is really looking to fund this type of project that has a widespread innovative partnerships in it. And then uh, next, hopefully uh, five years from now, you'll have the data you need to identify a preferred alternative and be able to do whatever zoning and coding updates you need uh, to work towards that preferred design uh, and implement a project that will keep Monterey moving. So final slide, please. Um, we do believe that Monterey can keep people and properties safe and keep transportation moving. And we've been just really enjoying this project and want to thank you again for giving us the opportunity to, to help you imagine Monterey. Well, thank you, Frederick and Rebecca. Uh, do we have final staff comments? Fernanda? Yes, um, I'd like to say also that obviously, um, many of you know that we have a new outreach portal called have your say monterey and there's a, a a specific page made just for sea level rise and mm -hmm. you can find a lot of information on that page including this study and in addition to other studies that have been conducted in the area um, and we encourage people to go to that website it's have your say monterey.org and find the sea level rise page. And you can put your ideas in there because we'd like to hear from the public what they think. And we've already heard from a bunch of people, including the La Playa townhomes, that they're very interested in this project and partnering with the city to do some short-term uh, flood barrier um, or some sort of beach nourishment. So, that it's already uh, working, we're getting the public interested. And so I think we'd like to hear more tonight from everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Fernanda. Uh, City Manager, anything else before we go to the public? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, I, I think we can go to the public uh, unless uh, the council has questions. Yeah, well, I, I would suggest we make our questions and discussion after we have public input. and. The action tonight would be basically to pass a resolution to accept the report, more or less. It's not to adopt any of these strategies necessarily, but simply to have a plan in place to going forward to look at different options. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, it's accept the study as is. Uh, it doesn't commit you to anything else. All right, good. Do we have any questions the council wants to ask before we go to the public? We should go public first. Yeah, public first. All right, let's open it up to the public. Nat, who, who's uh, with us this evening? We've got quite a few hands raised and uh, first person is Steve Hanley and we'll ask him to join us. Uh, Steve, welcome. Well, thank you. I, I didn't expect to go first, but uh, uh, my name is Steve Hanley. I, I'm a retiring real estate broker who owns a second home in the La Playa townhomes. Uh, and I'm planning to actually move permanently to Monterey since I love the community so much and will be retiring here in the next year or two. 
Um, I'd like to speak to a, a term that, that I think is better, better defines what I see is, is what should happen. And I would la- rather call it managed protection as opposed to managed retreat. Um, and I would ask, ask the council to consider the following things. First of all, I don't believe that community consensus is readily represented um, by the charts that have been presented and particularly by the percentages used to represent managed retreat. 70% of a pool of 60 or so responses and opinions is hardly a large pool of opinions on such a su- such an important matter. The city of Monterey is well over 20,000 people and 60 people are represented in, in the pool of, of, of opinions on, on managed retreat and so forth. There are 60 units in the La Playa townhomes and my odds are that you'd get way more uh, opinions uh, on managed re- uh, retreat than are representative uh, by staff here. That there are 1,549 residents in the Oak Grove area. Only 14% of them are homeowners. So you're not gonna get a whole lot of response from people who are transient in the sense of being tenants. So I, I think maybe a little bit deeper research and, and perhaps reaching out to, to the people other than a postcard might be in order here to find out what they really think. I'd also like to point out that there are a lot of alternative ideas to retreat that help protect exist, existing structures. Uh, you know, what was presented shows that over time, 35 of the units in the La Playa townhomes will be abandoned and left to the sea. I don't see any reason why a minimal amount of seawalls, riprap, uh, beach nourishment programs, and, and, and sharpening the, the curve points of a new new beach can't be done. At the same time, creating perhaps a benefit assessment district that incorporates the Oak Grove area. I certainly would be willing to pay for that to help uh, beach nourishment and so forth. And also the fact that Prop 19 is gonna make a huge difference in revenues that are gonna be coming into the city as properties transfer from generation to generation. All of those things need to be studied and help you know, with the fiscal impact of what can be done in the area. I've got a whole bunch of ideas like that that I'd love to share, but frankly, this came on so fast that I was ill-prepared until seeing the first presentation in December. So I would ask you to consider that before moving forward with any kind of, you know, managed retreat. Uh, Mr. Mr. Hanley, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, your your time has run out, but uh, we appreciate Understood. your feedback. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Our next caller is Kevin Dayton. And Kevin, if you could unmute and welcome. Thank, thank you, Nat. Thank you, uh, members of the city council. Uh, I always enjoy uh, looking at uh, predictions and vi- visions of the future. Uh, 2100, of course, is 80 years away and uh, much can happen in that particular time. I am uh, I think it might be a little uh, difficult to say, oh, we should spend hundreds uh, of millions of dollars on something that we're predicting for 2100. So I would try to actually, I would try to frame this issue in a different way. If you, you don't hear about this very much, but if you look deep into the web, uh, you will find various reports and studies about tsunami risk. And to tell you the truth, uh, the city of Monterey is very vulnerable to a tsunami, uh, particularly from something obscure, landslides within the submarine canyon in Monterey Bay. And uh, there are studies out there, sometimes I put them up on Twitter, uh, saying, uh, you know, within eight minutes, uh, you would have a five or six meter uh, tsunami come ashore. So basically, uh, you know, 16 to 20 feet. Uh, I don't believe that, I'm not even sure if any residents of Monterey would know what to do if, uh, or how they would know if something like this happened. 
And I think that if rather than framing this about some sort of prediction about uh, uh, dire situations in 2100, it might be better for you to frame about this saying, you know what, we're afraid about of the 20, 20 foot sea level rise in, in 10 minutes. And in fact, uh, you're talking here about perhaps uh, temporary barriers that could be put up. If you have an earthquake somewhere in Alaska or Japan and you realize that you're going to be the target of a tsunami, uh, perhaps uh, you would be able to mitigate some of the damage by putting something up. So my feeling is rather than talking about sea level rise and uh, doing these far projections, talk about the immediate threat that's always there of tsunamis that people don't think about. There are other places like Mont Marin County that talk about tsunamis all the time. They have their annual recognition of uh, Tsunami Awareness Week in March. And I think it's something that the city and the county should look more at doing here because it's a real threat and it's something that people don't think about. Thank you. Great, thanks, Kevin. All right, uh, we'll go to our next caller and that will be Johnny Chemis or Kemi. Sorry, we'll... Uh, Please uh, state your name and uh, we'll get going. Thank you, welcome. Uh, thank you, it's Johnny Camus. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a former council member for the city of San Jose and I recently bought a home uh, in, the, you know, La Playa, in La Playa Street in Monterey as my retirement home. And I was um, uh, looking forward to retiring there someday in the, in the future, near future. Um, my, my concern is this, uh, discussion of, of uh, managed retreat because I feel, I think that the pictures that were shown were, uh, had my house in the water, in, <laughs> so to speak. You know, I don't know what's going to happen to my dream of retiring in Monterey. Um, I know that you you guys did speak, that uh, you did send out some notices. You, you, you know, you may have, I, I just recently bought the home, but I'm very concerned that my new purchase is going to be underwater uh, in many, in literally. And um, I do, I, I do support the, the discussion that you had about beach nourishment and, and, and replacement. I did my homework before I got in. I know that their sea level rise is, is something to, to reckon with, but I, you know, I thought after the Semex plant um, shut down that we would see, uh, you know, further sand uh, buildup uh, that, you know, on the beaches. And, you know, we, we, I was told that at one point the city was dredging the, uh, the harbor and putting the sand, replenishing the sand with that. Uh, and, and I don't know what's going on with that program. I'd love to find out uh, what, what's going to be done uh, to, to do some, some uh, beach nourishment. And, and I support, you know, Steve and his, and his, and his thought process, this, the earlier speaker, on um, on ways to help mitigate some of this uh, with the the addition of having more people at the table. Again, um, this kind of took me by surprise. I hope that more efforts can be done for outreach before any decisions on uh, you know retreat uh, can are had. Uh, I also do support some of the temporary measures that uh, that are being discussed. To uh, I especially want to see some action on the replenishment because I, I have seen a lot of beach erosion since I've been uh, here. I take walks almost uh, daily on the beach and I see more and more of that uh, invasive species being washed away. Um, uh, the, the, um, the, that cactus plant or whatever the, the you know, the, the stuff that's all over the, the dunes. In any case, um, I'm hoping that the city council can, can have more discussions and actually take action on, on replenishment uh, sooner rather than later. I appreciate your, your thoughts and efforts on this and to try to plan for our future. Great, thank you, Johnny. Uh, we appreciate you calling in. Our next caller is Thomas. If you could state your last name, you're, we'd like to hear from you. Yes, uh, my name is Thomas Lee. Thank you very much for hearing me out tonight. I'm a retired US government research meteorologist. I retired from the Naval Research Laboratory in North Monterey. I've made a lot of weather forecasts, let me tell you. A lot of weather forecasts. And you know, weather forecasting has gotten a lot better. You can forecast accurately now a week, sometimes even two ahead 
something that you used to be only able to forecast like two or three days ahead. It's been amazing. However, climate forecasting, you know, predicting a season ahead, like, well, how much rain are we going to get this year? It, it's fallen way behind. We can't, it's not fallen well be, uh, way behind. It's really never been developed to that degree. Sea level rise, it's never been validated. In other words, in order to forecast well, you need to predict something and then later on validate your prediction. How well did my forecast meet the reality of what happened? We're, we're in uncharted territory here. And, we, and yet, from the tone of the discussions tonight, you all sound very certain, like this is a reality, this is happening. Uh, there's, there's no room for any discussion about whether it really is happening or it just might be happening. What they used to say to weathermen is the standing joke, look out the window. Is it really raining? You have a forecast of rain. And I would ask people, the council and, and, and helpers and consultants, look at the tides and currents NOAA.gov website, a government website. It lists, for example, the tidal gauge for Monterey, which shows very minimal um, increases in sea level. It, it's going currently, it's a steady increase. It's about a half inch for decade. There's nothing, there's nothing dramatic or threatening about what's happening. So sometimes when I hear these kinds of proposals and discussion, I go to that website and I say, well, it, is it happening today? Is, is the level happening today? Is, is, is there some sort of acceleration? And no, there isn't. And these kind of predictions of rapidly increasing sea level due to climate change, have, they've been going on now for 20 years and, and they, don't, they don't materialize. So I be, I'm just asking you to be a little bit more skeptical before costing out multi-million dollar road changes about whether the sea level is so real. You know, uh, modeling, anyway, that's my time. Thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you, uh, Thomas. We appreciate your help uh, or uh, your feedback here. Let's uh, go to Morgan Ivins Duran. Morgan, welcome. Um, good evening, and thank you, Mayor Roberson, council members, and city staff. My name is Morgan Ivins Duran, and I've been a resident of Monterey for five years and a homeowner for the last year and a half. And I want to thank the council and city staff for their focus on this important issue. As the agenda materials, tonight's presentation, and a growing body of research demonstrates, Sea level rise and associated coastal flooding will have dramatic impacts on our city. And I am encouraged seeing the city take this type of thoughtful, information-driven and proactive approach. I attended the workshop last December and provided more detailed comments on the specific adaptation strategies at that time. Given the scope of the agenda item tonight is just to adopt this report, I will simply reiterate my support for managed retreat rather than hard armoring approaches wherever possible. And in closing, I will say that I'm looking forward to additional opportunities for public input on the specific adaptation measures as they are developed for council consideration at a future date. Thank you. Great, thank you, Morgan. Next up is Alan Kramer. Hi, Alan. If you could unmute yourself. Okay. Yep. Yes, thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I, I, what I was going to say has been said pretty much earlier by the several uh, speakers talking about the Del Monte beach houses. Uh, in all of your plans, it looked like all of the houses, in the, and there are approximately 60 units there, 60 families are living there. Uh, are on the ocean side of the proposed seawall. That means either they're gone or flooded or maybe we can go fishing from our, our living room, I, I don't know. Uh, but I would love to see some thought given to the families and people that live in those 60 units. 
but meanwhile, what Steve and others have said, I, I will support uh, and, re and I, I don't want to take your time unnecessarily. That's all I have to say at this point, uh, except the value, of, the value of the properties uh, that we're talking about is approximately 60 to $70 million that would be lost if indeed a seawall were put on the inside of our property. Thank you very much. I'll take no further time. Thank you, Alan. Next caller is, let's see here, uh, Lee Shahanian, and we'll go to Lee. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Thank Welcome. You. Good evening, Mayor Kwai and fellow city council members. My name is Lee Shahinian. Thanks so much for the opportunity to comment this evening. My wife and I have a home in Monterey. Uh, this city has a special place in our hearts with its rich California history, its shops and restaurants, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and walking and biking opportunities. And, and for residents and tourists alike, Monterey is defined uh, as much as anything by the beautiful Del Monte Beach. I was pleased to see in their presentation this evening, uh, Mr. Venter and Ms. Verity uh, recommended beach nourishment as an immediate priority, an immediate priority. In May, 2019, the city of Monterey published its Monterey Bay Opportunistic Beach Nourishment Program. In that extensive study, several offshore sites were identified as, as potential sources of sand to nourish Del Monte Beach. I hope Monterey can now proceed with its plans for nourishing Del Monte Beach, so vital to the life of this uh, special city. Finally, I strongly agree with the previous comments of Mr. Hanley, Dr. Kramer, and Mr. Camus. Monterey needs much more input from its Oak Grove community residents. Any retreat plan, any retreat plan must be combined with significant protection of their real property. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks for your feedback, Lee. Next up is Esther Malkin. Welcome, Esther. Good evening, everybody. I just wanted to comment on the fact that um, it's important that the city look at what they're looking at right now. And I can tell you from the, from the perspective of seeing exactly what putting it off um, does to a city. I grew up in Miami Beach, Florida, and everybody thinks that the only time there are, there are flooding issues or climate issues there is when there's a hurricane, which ha the, the hurricane season since I grew up to now has exploded. But the reason I want to bring up this this comment is when it is bright and sunny and there is no rain and no hurricanes in Florida on Miami Beach particularly, if there's are if there are king tides, they are ankle deep now just walking on the streets along the along Ocean Drive. It is not you know uh, only when it's with when there's a storm front. This is bright and sunny days. That city is spending billions of dollars to redo things that they that have been built relatively recently, like last decade. And because they had political um, presence in that in that government that refused to acknowledge climate change for decades before, they are paying the price now. And there are numerous documentaries that you can see this on, on PBS. There's one called Sinking Cities. And it shows literally the streets that I grew up on in broad sunshine with people, everyday people going about their business in ankle high water. It's not Venice where they, you know, they have it going on over there and they have knee deep water. But if we don't look at this now, it will cost us way more in the future. So thank you for taking the proactive approach 
instead of waiting because it would be a grave mistake to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. And we also have uh, Kurt joining us. Hi, Kurt. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Hi, my name is Kurt Tipton. I'm president of the Downtown Neighborhood Association. And I uh, made a comment when the Planning Commission was talking about sea level rise. And I want to make sure that the count, I believe I wrote to all of you also at the council and, and the mayor. But it seems that retreat is the most common or the best approach. And given that, you really need to relook at the downtown overlay. You're starting to put high density housing in an area that you know is going to flood. So I think you need to go back. The planning commission needs to go back and really take a look at the downtown overlay. I did a somewhat a poll and for the most part, the people in the downtown, not everyone, but for the most part, they were agreeing that probably the retreat was the better approach rather than trying to uh, build a wall to keep the sea level out. And given the current data that's coming in, the sea level rise is gonna happen faster and towards the top end of all the model projections rather than at the low end. So in another year or so, I think the city needs to go back and relook at the model that they used, or the the consultants used, and relook at, at this again. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, Kurt. Yep. Mr. Mayor and Council, that concludes public comment on our item tonight. Good. Thank you, Nat, and and thank you for all of the people who have shared their thoughts with us. As always, I'm always uh, so impressed by how articulate, or, or articulate, how articulate, there you go, I'm not articulate tonight, uh, articulate our, our, our residents and friends are, and how many viewpoints they have. And I think uh, this is going to be an ongoing discussion. Any of the thoughts that people have that want to share with us, send them in, in writing, uh, email us. The more information we can get, the better. So we do appreciate that. So council, uh, thoughts before we pass a resolution, if that's what we do, does anyone want to start us off? Mr. Mayor, just okay. wanted to clarify, are we going to ask questions first and then go to comments or is it just uh, sort of- Just both. both we'll, and, we're going to just okay. do it all together, yes. Because I do have some questions. Off, yeah, I, 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 yeah, can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. I, I certainly have some comments. I think I'll hold off on those and ask my questions first. One question, um, there was some comments from the public about beach nourishment. And my understanding is that the council and, and staff have been, uh, I know we've approved beach nourishment, I believe it's happening, but I think it would be helpful if somebody from staff could speak to that and clarify the kind of beach nourishment program we have already implemented. And then are we contemplating something sort of in, in uh, addition to that so that's my first question so i i can quickly uh respond about uh one element of the um beach nourishment that was mentioned was the dredging uh, of the harbor and then uh, taking the uh, materials over to the beach uh, we will it's planned to resume beach dredging uh, in the fall time uh, this year, 2021. Our permit for this is still valid and active, and uh, we are planning on um, resuming dredging sometime later this year. And the other question I punt over to Kim, who knows more about that part. Um, thank you, Hans. So the city, much like we did with the Caltrans grant, obtained a grant to study beach nourishment because it was a recommendation from an earlier um, sea level rise study. And what we were able to do with that study that the city council adopted was create the, develop the protocol 
for what that would what a program would look like. And so we now know that obviously, if we were to take dredged materials from Laguna Grande Lake, we know that the chemical testing that would need to occur. We also understand about grain size and what would be acceptable to be put on our beach. So we have um, that study gave us the rough scientific framework on how to move forward. Um, the next step, if the city decides it wants to go forward with a more comprehensive beach nourishment project would be involve um, some of the things people talked about tonight. Um, creating possibly an assessment district to finance that beach nourishment so the affected properties along the coast could possibly help per, um, pay for that program. We would have to obtain all the coastal permits, um, National Marine Sanctuary, Regional Water Quality Control Board, Fish and Game, and that those permits by themselves could easily be around $200,000. So it would be a serious capital infrastructure decision to go forward with a very comprehensive beach nourishment program. I'll say that the grant work we did and the environmental work we did took us a big step closer to looking at that as a feasible alternative. And Kim, do we have any sense of like how much time or how much protection, let's say a fully aggressive um, beach nourishment program could provide? I haven't seen any scientific data that uh, that's answered that question. What all of the scientists that we've worked with has said, it's sort of the first step. If you want to do beach nourishment, it'll be worthwhile for you know the early phases of um, sea level rise and increased flooding that we could foresee. And then um, one of the speakers brought up the Semex plant and how Obviously, they're hopeful. I know I'm hopeful that that might lead to sort of natural beach replenishment uh, because we won't be taking as much sand out. Um, and I just want to confirm, my assumption is that our study didn't really try to account for that and probably because it's a big unknown. But could you confirm that essentially at this point, we're not really factoring that in uh, to, our, to our estimates? Is that correct? That's correct. And I think you do need to understand there's two different coastal processes happening as well. There's erosion that's occurring and things like beach nourishment can help with erosion. Eventually, sea level rise um, is anticipated to sort of eclipse the erosion impacts as the beaches diminish and the seas rise. There's sort of two factors happening. And then the price tag for the transportation um, adaptations that were presented tonight, do they include the cost of acquiring the land? I know I read in the report that part of a planned retreat would involve basically purchasing land from property owners in order to sort of make them whole. Um, but it, but it wasn't clear to me if that was wrapped up in these costs um, for the projections of the transportation network, or if that would be another cost that we would have to account for. Um, I can say that, uh, for example, the managed retreat, the routing Delmoni Avenue through Oak Grove, we do not have an estimate of what it would take to buy up those properties. So it was the construction costs were just estimating that itself, the construction and moving utilities, um, but not really buying up property that wasn't factored in. Okay. And then my last question, I, I appreciate the uh patients of my colleagues, it has to do with sort of the projection of need, future needs for the transportation network. And one of the things I guess I'm cognizant of it's, is just that's, there's so much potential change there as we see people's transportation habits change and as we see technology changing. But I just wanna confirm, Really, right now, we're working with what we know based on kind of the types of trips and the amount of trips people are making today. Is that correct? 
<clears throat> yes, that that's absolutely correct. So, so the latest information we have is what we uh, what was available just before COVID. Um, you know, as things change, I think we're every all the whole transportation industry is in. Uh, uh, what 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 does it look like in the future? That those changes will happen. Um, you know, but I've, I'm also thinking. You know, the the tourism industry in Monterey. You know, not a lot of those people can work from home, right? We still so so. I've I've got to be very hesitant to say we're going to have 20 or 30 percent of the people that travel to Monterey all of a that all of a sudden work from home. Um, so you really got to think around. You know, the the market that you serve and 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 the people that need to commute. Thanks, and I'll hold off on my comments until the rest of you have had a chance. Okay, great questions. Thanks, Alan, for the clarifications. Uh, council questions, comments? Council Member Ed? Yeah, I, I had a, a question or two back in the presentation. Um, there was a reference to, and it's on packet page 144, and that was the ecotone. Am I saying that word right, uh, Levy? Ecotone, Levy? Ecotone. E ecotone. Okay. I, I told you I'm slow. So the ecotone. <laughs> um, so explain a little bit more to me about that. Is that the type of thing where water's coming in and we're pumping it out? So I just wanted to get a little bit more explanation of that, that as a distant option. So you've, you've asked sort of two questions in, in one. So I'm going to try and pull those two apart. Okay. When you talk about barriers, you can talk about a wall, which we think of as a very upright vertical rectangular thing, usually made of concrete and steel. Or you can talk about a levee, which is more of a uh, hill that's, that's used to hold back water and is usually earthen as the main component of its, of its structure, but engineered earth, not just dirt piled up. Okay. So typically, when you talk about like a FEMA certified levy, which is the kind of levy that FEMA comes and looks at and says, yes, this provides enough flood protection that the people on the dry side are safe, those tend to be unvegetated. They're kept bare um, for very, like, because vegetation brings in burrowing animals, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're sort of narrow and they can, they can be wide enough that you can have a trail on top, a 10-foot trail, that would be fine, but they're bare dirt. An ecotone levy is allowed to be planted, allowed to look like the natural environment, so it would mimic those dunes in the photo that I showed you, mm -hmm. but in order to have that provide the same level of safety because of the vegetation and because of some other reasons, it's got a much wider footprint. So an ecotone levy provides more ecological value. It provides more recreational value. It's aesthetically more pre pleasing. It just takes up a much bigger piece of land. So that's, that's what an ecotone levy is. Then you asked a second question, which is what about pumping and how do we drain? Um, any barrier is meant to stop water going in either direction. And all of the hills of Monterey drain down towards Lake Alistero, which currently drains by gravity out to the bay. When you put a levee or a wall or any other barrier between the downtown and the bay, you've got to either pump that water out over that barrier or get it somehow under the barrier. If you use just the open drains that you have right now, as seas rise, the ocean will eventually be higher than Lake Alistero, and the ocean will backflow through those drains. So you need different types of backflow prevention. They're using this already in San Francisco. The seas have risen in San Francisco Bay so much that the San Francisco storm sewers are draining into the sewage plant and destroying the sewage plant so they're having to already they've already installed a lot of backflow protection in san francisco so here regionally it's become an issue already um, so if we put a barrier and this is another thing to um, councilman hafa's point what did we cost out we did not cost out pumps we did not cost out 
backflow prevention. So there's additional costs that would need to be taken into consideration, which is why we're recommending additional studies for those. Okay, great. And, and as you know, we have a pump system now. When we have high tide, full moon, and the conditions are just right, we have a problem between El Estero and the ocean. Thank you for uh, covering that. The other thing the report indicated, and maybe this is a question for Fernanda, the report indicated some of the uh, collaboration we did with uh, stakeholders. Uh, I noticed the US Army was listed, and, and maybe I missed it, Department of Defense, and to include the Navy and uh, Corps of Engineers. So were we reaching out to any of those in terms of getting input, uh, particularly interested in the Navy Postgraduate School impact to uh, potential rises on Del Monte? Yes, um, we did invite the Army and NPS representatives, and they attended our first stakeholder meeting, which was just a local stakeholder focused meeting. Um, and they identified risks um, and priorities for their facilities. Um, so that that flow chart that Rebecca showed earlier on, that showed their risks included in there such as economic impacts and traffic impacts on Delmani and, and from having to um, having too much traffic trying to get in, into their bases or um, such things. Uh, however, um, after following up with uh, NPS representatives, um, they did mention that it looked like either alternative, uh, barrier alternative or a managed retreat alternative would work for them because they have the gate on Del Monte Avenue and the other one on Sloat. Um, and the one on Sloat would be if Del Monte flooded that far, which is not predicted to flood to the, up to that gate, uh, then they could use Sloat Avenue. Um, so from their perspective, they didn't feel like, like they were being affected up to the year 2100. The army, they they did voice concerns about the lighthouse tunnel and traffic having to be uh, diverted to Pacific Street in order to enter their gates in their facility. Mm -hmm. um, but that was their main concern. And then um, the US Coast Guard, um, we did invite them to participate many times. However, they did not um, attend any of our meetings. Okay. Okay, I'd like great. to make one addition to that. I think um, as we're working with the planners at both the Navy School as well as the Army, this type of information and ultimate decisions by the city helps them in their master planning. Um, you know, alternative access can be developed to those bases. And um, so this really helps inform them about where are the flood risks and how should they be planning for the future as well. Yeah. Great. Uh, I have a few comments, but uh, I'll yield to everybody else for right now for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. You were on mute, but I'll go yeah, ahead. Gotcha. Go ahead, Dan, Thanks. please. It, it's interesting. If you look at some of the um, some of uh, historical pictures of uh, Del Monte and El Estero in the 1900s, uh, your management uh, retreat almost looks exactly like what it looked like in the 1900s. It's, it's very, very similar. My, but you know, whenever I look at those pictures, I always ask the question about um, uh, if you have a high um, wave uh, going in, high waves going into that, that, uh, that area, how do you protect those beaches, the, the, the beaches that you're, you're looking at uh, putting in? And, um, and, and then the, the stormwater that, that drains into that, I guess would be called a lagoon. H how do you um, how do you manage um, the, the amount of water that's coming in and the sea that's that, that's coming in the opposite direction and pushing uh, water uh, towards um, either to to each one uh, uh, Del Monte or Oak Grove? Does that make sense? I, I don't quite understand how you protect that area from storm uh, damage. Right, I understand what you're saying. Um, we didn't get that far into calculating all of those costs and extra infrastructure. 
like Rebecca said, the scope didn't include um, costing out and designing flood uh, flood drainage infrastructure. Um, so this was a very transportation focused study. Uh -huh. And yeah. so um, that's why we would need additional studies to figure out how do we shape our infrastructure like utilities to accommodate a managed retreat scenario. Okay, thank you. Good. Any questions, uh, Tyler, at this point? Council member Tyler? I see Rebecca um, raising her hand. I just wanted to maybe see if she can jump in and comment real quick. Sure, Rebecca, you were gonna help answer that question? If, if I can add a little to what Fernanda said, um, just a, a, the topic of waves is a really important consideration with any sheltered waterway. Um, and, sorry, I, I didn't formulate my answer perfectly before I began it. We looked at different configurations. Um, any configuration that we drew at this very high early conceptual level would be just that. It, we're at 60,000 feet, we're conceptual, but planning a configuration to block waves, any new um, piers, any upgrades to the existing piers could be done in a way that they're providing a breakwater for incoming waves. And you also, as you know, living so close to the Monterey Canyon and living with waves, the longer and shallower your wave approach is, the more dampening effect you have. So you've got deep water really close to shore, but as you come into a shallow harbor, and we're talking you know, just a few feet, that does help dampen waves all by itself. So that, that new sheltered waterway could be designed to dampen waves as well, is all, is all I wanted to say. Thank you. So, so my, my my first question here is uh, regarding the comments made earlier about the FEMA funding and how if you are working with partners um, and, and really developing collaboration that it, it really is a positive sign for FEMA. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to any efforts that are happening at the state level to for them to take the leadership in having coastal cities work together um, uh, and trying to leverage additional FEMA grants. Yes, um, I've been attending uh, Coastal Commission meetings where this type of effort is being discussed. Um, other, there's just many, many different agencies talking about this, the Coastal Conservancy, including one of them. Um, and unfortunately, we just don't have a coordinated approach from the state level. And I think that's exactly what we need, um, but we're not there yet. And I've voiced this opinion at every meeting that I can attend. Um, it's So the FEMA grant that the city of Monterey applied for, there's just so, the, the funding is so limited and we're fighting for, you know, the one that I just applied for, um, we were fighting for $600,000 and that, that was for the entire state. And more than a hundred applications were filed for more than $10 million. So it's just, we need to see some, some, uh, how do you say, commitment from the state. Um, so I, I guess right now, all we can do is just keep pushing and keep applying for grants. But I think in the end, it's it's gonna take some sort of directive from the governor and, or from some something higher than than just the city. Well, I definitely if appreciate- I may, oh, If I may add on. one sentence uh, briefly. So number one, we should, have uh, we should have applied for unemployment with the California EDD and we could have funded a lot of coastal protection. The, the, the part that is very important is to realize that a city cannot do this by themselves. We are sitting here and, and the, the consultants uh, elegantly um, roll hundreds of millions of dollars out of their, of, uh, of their tongues that we have to do. 
Cities cannot afford that. Cities should not be left alone. This is a responsibility that the state has to bear and the cities can contribute very, 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 very marginally, keep in mind all the tasks that we are doing, but these are predominantly the task of the state to protect their residents and their citizens. And, and uh, Fernanda is right. Uh, we try to mention this uh, all the time and uh, it would be great if also um, you, the elected leaders can take this to heart and also carry that word forward. Yeah, no, I was just gonna give uh, appreciation to Fernanda's leadership in, in regards to touting that message in any spaces that she can and obviously all the work that's gone into this. So um, truly much appreciation there and the great representation that you provide for the city. Um, I, I definitely agree that there, there obviously should be more um, uh, leadership at the state level. And, and I wonder if we could, um, as a council, um, sign a letter and, and direct that to the appropriate officials at the state level to help support the staff and the work that they're trying to do. So just kind of wanted to throw that out um, off of that question, but I'll, I'll move on to, to my next one here. Um, I'm just wondering, and I, it's been identified a little bit about um, having future studies, and I understand that there's going to be work continuing here but I'm wondering, and this, uh, this may be a little bit rhetorical, but, but I'm wondering mm -hmm. how much effort um, are we going to put into actually aligning um, the, the results of this study and, and, and consecutive ones to, to come uh, with the overall strategy, right? So we talked about this with, with Alan, uh, starting off with Alan's comments um, at the last council meeting with the retreat, with having strategy sessions. How are we gonna get this aligned with what that is and develop milestones so that we make sure that we're helping ourselves along as these um, as these different things need to happen in order to achieve X project um, in at, at, a, at an ample and an efficient time. I'm not sure if anybody wants to respond to that. Yes. So um, right now, I think the tool that we have is to apply for grants that will fund those studies that will help us to get to an infrastructure project um, that then we build um, with more funding help. <laughs> so um, that study that Rebecca mentioned um, that we need to build partnerships and, and do a benefit cost analysis of you know, what it takes, the cost of losing all these properties along the coast versus protecting them versus um, how do we also measure our ecosystem benefits and, and costs? Um, so that all needs to be packaged into uh, some sort of benefit cost analysis that then helps us make a very informed decision about what, what scenario we would like to see, uh, a flood barrier or, or completely retreating. Um, so that's where we're at. We're applying for funding. Um, that will help us do those additional studies with milestones, like you said. So it'll help us figure out, okay, now that we're here, what do we do next? And now that we decide this, what do we do next? So um, that's very important. And, and again, those partnerships are also very important. Um, but again, we calculated that that type of study would cost about $400,000. And so it's just a large chunk of money that we're talking about. Um, and then, if, but if we can get partners to help us with that, it could be cheaper for everyone in the end. So that's why that's uh, partnerships are so important. Awesome. No, and the cost benefit analysis element of it is is so important. And of course, that's up to the person that creates it. What that really comes out looking like. What things are they including as? costs what things are they including as benefits are we looking at the real true cost of things um, um i think there's a lot of questions that go into that but i have two more questions regarding traffic um and so let me let me get to the first one here which is i, I was a little bit confused by the models um and how they would divert traffic and going on to slow and then kind of pearl when i would imagine that wouldn't most of the traffic that comes off that first exit in monterey um, kind of at the border of Monterey and Seaside there, I, I would imagine wouldn't most of the traffic 
um, reroute and take the second exit in Monterey, and then it would maybe prioritize more of that option with Fremont, as opposed to developing a lot of traffic congestion um, in, in the space that would kind of be cut off from, from the, uh, from removing Del Monte there. So I think if one looks at the model, right, we have the the major interchanges would be Del Monte and the next one's Fremont and then Munras, right? So those are the main ones that go into the city. Um, I think Fremont carries, between Fremont and Del Monte, they carry the most traffic right now, but Del Monte also comes from Seaside. So there's a lot of, not traffic off Highway 1, but from Seaside that comes into the city. Um, you know, Del Monte, like our tunnel, is, 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 is your biggest um, uh, arterial that carries the most traffic, without a doubt. So so what what the model does it, it, it looks at the network and see where the capacity is how much traffic is there already right and it says well how much more traffic can i add to that without sort of blowing up if i can put it that way <clears throat> so I cut the road off i still live in seaside i still work in downtown monterey what's the best route to get there and the model then go and through the system of the roadways decides uh, where, where those trips should go um, you will see there's substantial um, uh, diversion of traffic actually onto Highway 68 as well. So, so people will take Highway 68, Holman Highway, and actually go down David Street, right, to get to Canary Road. So, um, you know, what, what if, if one really focuses in on the model, you will see that there's every route that is a little route that traffic can carry on, traffic will divert to. It, it causes so much grid in the system overall that, it, that the system collapses. And that's why if you close too many roads, Right? People just cannot get into the city and then you have collapse of, of a sort of an economic collapse because people cannot get to the jobs, they can't go to school, they can't get to the, to the army bases, they can't get to the hotels. It's just uh, that ripple effect is, is really um, detrimental to, to, to the survival of the city. No, I, I just wanted to bring it up because I was kind of trying to run through my mind how I would best travel around if I was coming from that space with that road cut off. And I, I'm even thinking mm -hmm. there's that exit that right past that gas station there, if you were coming from Seaside and you can kind of come across to Casa Verde, mm -hmm. um, there's that on-ramp to the highway there too, but I'm not a, a an engineer, so I, I will stop my, my comments there. But the, the last thing I wanted to bring up was just to consider, uh, Dan, did you wanna jump in on that? Yeah, Tyler, if, if I can add on to one of your uh, questions. I, I'm wondering in 1987, when that Del Monte was flooded, did, is there any data to, about where the traffic patterns went when that was flooded, I, nobody was here, or do we have anything, Hans, that shows which direction people went, or was there a problem, or obviously there was, or probably not, right? I, I don't know any any data from the 1987 flooding. I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, I actually think it's from the 90s. Just so you know, I think it was yeah. like 94, 95, yeah. and. Yeah. It's like there was flooding on the Carmel River, there was flooding on Del Monte, oh. there was flooding on Highway 68 in Salinas, and Is we actually we... Beca we became an island for yeah, a few days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and and I, um, I, 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 I didn't want to correct the slide. I think it was the 1997 flooding. Oh. Uh, and uh, the reason for that flooding was that the Navy Lake went over the, um, over its uh, over its shoreline because uh, the the storm drain that uh, empties out the navy lake uh, into the uh, ocean uh, was plugged and the water streamed down from the navy lake the skating ring was flooded and then uh, down to uh, to the area that you saw on the picture and the, uh, at that time that the, the uh, I, I remember it actually um, the uh, roads were all so uh, difficult to access that there was really zero traffic coming in and out. It was in the middle of winter also. And uh, then uh, after we uh, in Public Works created um, a very creative solution to get rid of the uh, water, uh, the Del Monte was passable again. Of course, the road was damaged and uh, subsequently we had to do some very costly maintenance uh, from, from that. But there are still pictures out there where, where people were canoeing on Del Monte in, in that section, but the water came from the Navy Lake. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, thank you, Tyler. Uh, yeah, uh, Mayor, Mayor, can I offer something? Sure. Uh, yeah, I had the the, uh, the privilege of working midnight shift uh, when we had the torrential, torrential downpour and uh, your local archivists are gonna be Bill Reichsmith and uh, Les Turnbull. 
Um, but that was uh, a storm that was three or four days steady, the, similar to the rains we had last week where the rain didn't stop and then the pumps were you know, overflowing and, and the maintenance fell behind to be able to clear it. And that's where you know, Del Monte flooded and it actually flooded the, the uh, Del Monte skating rink as well. And we lost power. So we were an island from the south and the north and there was hardly any traffic, Dan, because no one could go out. The power was out. People stayed home. And this was, you know, before we could work home with our computers and Zoom. So uh, the town just kind of shut down and it was a late winter storm. I think it was like March or April. And um, actually, as Hans said, it cleared up once they got the water out. And uh, then it was a matter of rebuilding Del Monte and fixing the potholes. But uh, there was really no traffic to worry about because it disappeared for three or four days. And that's what would happen in a future storm is that people, people can't get there, the power's out. And so hopefully they stay away until the, the roadways get open again. But that was, that was a good lesson on making sure that we uh, maintain all of the drains and we have the people that are available to work at night to clear the pumps, turn the pumps on and be ready. And we haven't had anything since like since that time. Good, thanks uh, for the history. I, I, as you were speaking, I recall all that now. Very good. Yeah. Uh, Tyler, I, you were uh, had yeah. one more point I think you wanted to make. Yeah, but I, I just, I'm not sure if you noticed, Dan, when you when you said 1987, I kind of chuckled because that was the year I was born. So I thought you were trying to make a joke about <laughs> my, my age. <laughs> if I would have known, Tyler, I would have made a joke. But... <laughs> Well, now it's out there. So, no. Um, so, my last question here is in regards to 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 rail. Um, it doesn't seem like rail has been considered, but I know that there is plans um, in, in, with TMC regarding that. And I just wonder if we can keep that in mind as we move forward with potential options moving forward in the future, especially given the 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 public transit uh, element. Uh, was really being aggressive with 20%, right? That's very optimistic, but I think that a rail option being in there can can really um, help with achieving that. So anyways, I just kind of wanted to throw that out there as well. You're welcome to come to the TAMSI board meetings anytime you want, Tyler. And I would love to join you. <laughs> yeah, Mo Monday at three o'clock once a month, we have the TAMSI rail meeting and uh, I'll, I'll keep you informed. There's some stuff coming and we'll, We'll ask for presentation here soon at when it's the right time. I love that. Thanks, Ed. Good. Let's go back to Alan then for comments. We'll we'll go around again for comments because I don't have any questions at this point. So Alan, start us off with some thoughts and observations, please. Well, first of all, I want to thank our staff for um, being proactive in pursuing these grants and um, really making sure that we are thinking about the future so that we don't get caught off guard um, like Miami. And like all too often, human, we as humans tend to respond to what's in front of us. We're not very good at recognizing and planning for threats that seem remote or seem abstract, and then they hit us. And so we're, we're gonna be ready. And I think that's something I'm very proud of. Um, I would like to say that, first of all, in the short term, totally support the idea of pursuing beach replenishment and nourishment in um, whatever way that we can and doing whatever we can to be, you know, fight through those uh, bureaucratic barriers that you mentioned, Kim. Um, and, and also would be interested in hearing a report on what the cost of those temporary emergency uh, barriers might be. I think that's something we should also look into um, for these big storm events. Um, I have a lot of thoughts here that have to do with sort of other plans that we have, because it seems to me this, you know, it's not only our transportation network, and it's not even only our utilities, but um, this really does, should impact and inform our master plan. And I'm not sure what the schedule for that, you know, reviewing that is and updating it. But, you know, um, 
Uh, I think that we, we need to look at our master plan and figure out how this is going to change that in the long term. Do we, and I think the, it was a good point that um, Mr. Tipton brought up, which is, you know, as we look at city owned sites to develop affordable housing, what is the real risk? And do we want to be putting it in a potential uh, flood zone for the future? Um, as we look at Windows on the Bay, which has been um, a driving imaginary vision for the city that I think we all embrace, and I certainly believe has been influential in forming Monterey into the place that we all love. But I just wonder, you know, going forward, do we really want to be purchased? You know, so much of that was about developing that property there for parks and also acquiring property to try to develop the Del Monte corridor. Does that make sense going forward if in 10 or 20 years we could be seeing not uncommon flooding of that transit corridor? I don't know. I think that we need to really take another look at how this might impact our long-term plans, both for the master plan, for our general plans and our overlays and, and, and for window on the bay and, and the wharf master plan. So on a planning level, those are some of my thoughts. Um, regarding the future um, uh, grant that we might seek to do additional research and planning, Here's some of the things that I think you need to look at. Some of these have been mentioned, but I really just want to reiterate. So putting up a wall all along there, we, we've talked about the cost of pumps and backflows, and I think you need to cost that out. But I think you also need to can try to consider impact on tourism. I mean, one of the things that makes Monterey a desirable place to live and visit is our accessible beaches, windows on the bay, just um, how you can easily get to and interact with the ocean. If you've got a big wall, it is not going to be the same. That's not going to be the Monterey that we know. And I think that's probably why a lot of the feedback we've gotten is about um, this idea of managed retreat. So I'd like to know how that might affect tourism. Um, and then on the other hand, the retreat, I think we need to be realistic and, and look at what would be the cost of the um, land that would be lost and the value of that land. But then I think you also need to look at the value of the augmented beach. So, you know, getting a huge, in essence, ocean estuary with beach all along it, how much would that increase the value um, again, both to tourism and then also the, um, the, the value environmentally. Because again, if you put up a big wall, essentially you're cutting off and kind of killing the native habitat that is now part of El Estero. So I don't know, there are people who can calculate that value, I believe, I think it's a difficult thing to do, but I think you have to look at that, the environmental cost of losing that habitat, the tourist, the tourism value of increasing all of that a beach, uh, and then also though the cost of the lost land that is currently developed. So I think um, I support the idea of moving forward with more studies. And I would just like to say um, in closing that although this, this is a real risk, this is, this is something that we already heard, it's happening in other places. Um, we don't necessarily know how fast it's going to happen. This is an estimate and we are talking about large windows or horizons of time, but it is going to happen. We need to plan for it. And um, I don't believe that cutting Monterey off from the sea inherently, my intuition is, that's probably not going to be the best approach long-term. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Let, let's go to Dan next, please. Dan, some comments and thoughts. Uh, you're, unmute, please. 
Sorry, you would think I know that by now. Alan, thank you for bringing up the, the thought about a big seawall right in front of, of Del Monte. It doesn't surprise me when I look at the results of the survey that that seawall was not their number one choice. Because to me, uh, I, I, can't, I can't imagine a big wall right in front of El Estero Lake. I, I just can't see it, to be honest with you. Um, I, I do agree with Alan when uh, we look at a master plan, because uh, as you know, uh, back in the 30s and 40s, when they started to talk about the window of the bay, those were some um, some council members that, that could see in the future, and they probably know that they would never see the end results of that window of the bay. Well, we're probably sitting in that same position, where we probably will never see the results as council members. Maybe Clyde will, but we won't ever see the, the ending uh, end results of it. But we can start that that look in, into the future of what that particular area um, should look like. And I think, as Alan mentioned, it has to be a master plan, it has to be written into a master plan, maybe its own master plan of some type of just that particular region. So um, I, I do agree that as they start to talk more and more and ask more and more questions, there have been some costs that haven't been calculated, which I figured they wouldn't, um, and that needs to be uh, addressed. But um, and the the thought of having additional beach uh, fronts uh, throughout that that lagoon area is is very interesting to me. Um, in transportation, also trying to get through that spot uh, would be very difficult uh, to to correct. But I, I look at it more from a, a higher level that um, even though we won't be seeing these improvements in our lifetime, maybe, um, but uh, it's nice to know that we got it started through uh, some type of, of a master plan. So that's, that's what I would like to say. Thank you, Dan. Tyler, you, were you had some comments for us, please? Yeah, so I, I, think, um, I think it's important for us to think, why are we here in the first place? And this is directly linked to, to climate change. And so I think it's an important thing to just start off with my comments and saying, because it, it, we have to recognize why we got here. And what we're having to do now is develop, help support a, a developing a strategy to not further kick the can down the road and put the, the burden on future generations. So I'm glad to see that we're, we're taking this step forward now, but it also provides us an opportunity to use science-based fact-driven, uh, data-driven decisions in order to help guide the, the, the policy decisions as we, as we move forward for our community. Um, I, I really appreciate the, the approach to the study um, and, and the use of worst case scenario. And, and I think we have to keep that in mind as we're having these conversations that this is the worst case scenario, but it is important to look at that just in case we have to see how far do we have to potentially go. So I think it's important for everybody in the community to, to take this with a grain of salt. This is just a, a, a very um, premature step in, in very many more opportunities for the uh, not just the city of Monterey, but other public agencies to engage with the public and receive um, public input about how best to move forward here. But, but I appreciate uh, the process. Um, I also believe it's important to, to plan and prepare for the future while, while we uh, advise, uh, advise ways of mitigating issues between um, now and then. Um, so I'm excited to see how, how these plans move forward. I think it's important to keep um, in mind a couple of things, the economic impacts, Alan was speaking to this earlier. I think it, the word that comes to my mind is aesthetically pleasing, right? If, I, if we see a big seawall, I don't see that as something desirable for folks to, to wanna look at. Um, so keeping that open space and, and an opportunity for people to enjoy the beautiful coastline that we have in whichever form it ends up taking in the future, um, I think uh, is, is an exciting opportunity um, as, as the report identified. Um, and, and, and so two more points here. Um, there was a comment made in during the public comments about receiving public input. And, and I would just say that this is an opportunity for you all to help be cheerleaders for the work that we're trying to do within the city and, and share with your neighbors, share with your social circles, 
this new tool that we have in the city that um, I, I'm not sure if it was Fernanda that spoke about it earlier. I think I think you did, Fernanda. It was the um, um, now it's leaving me. Uh, have your save Monterey tool. So that way, you know, it's easily accessible. It's an awesome tool. I went on and played with it. You can see who the people are in the city that are getting the information um, regarding the topic of your interest. And knowing that this is an option on there is a great way for you to just share, simply share a link with your connections so that we can further get some public input from, from folks in the public. Um, my last comment is, is that I hope as we move forward with whatever these whatever the plans are for, for this and other mitigation efforts. Um, we, are, we are really keeping alternative modes of transportation at the forefront. So walking, biking, um, public transit, this is a really good opportunity for us to focus on these areas and, and almost force a change in the culture as opposed to waiting for it to happen naturally, which may never happen if we don't take that leadership um at the forefront so i just really want to wanted to push that idea thanks again for everybody the consultants um city staff this is uh, really exciting thank you oh, we appreciate your good comments uh, council member ed yeah thank you very much um i'm just going to run down the list um but before i do that i just want to say that um that I, I don't know how to prioritize something where we don't have the final information. Uh, this is going to be an ongoing series of decisions, ongoing science data uh, for many years to come and many other councils to come. I don't see this as, you know, uh, in the next year we make a decision and all of a sudden, you know, we're cutting checks and going on contracts and we're building a seawall or we're building a, a viaduct. This is going to be um, a very slow, ongoing uh, process that is responding to additional information that comes in as we get additional studies. And I think that was part of what Fernanda and the uh, presenters were talking about is that there are additional opportunities to study many more options as California becomes much more educated. So I look forward to some of those options as we can get a little bit more enlightenment because right now, there are so many things that are possible. Uh, there's a lot of maybes, but there isn't a lot of things that are certain, except for we know we'll have projects to decide on in the future. So look forward to some of the more of those options as we get uh, additional studies that come forward. Um, also, I wanna say thank you for uh, staff for uh, presenting this with uh, Rebecca and Frederick. Uh, Frederick, we've seen you for many years and, and gotten to see many uh, presentations and and I see him often at at Tamsi as well with some of the work that they're doing related to transportation so thank you very much Rebecca and Frederick and staff um, a lot of the comments had to do with uh, additional permitting that we know we'll have to get trying to um, you know arm the the waterfront uh, talking about beach nourishment and all of that and the thought of trying to get the Coastal Commission to allow us, to do so many of the things that we know we're gonna to have to do almost seems like an insurmountable, um, enormous task, but we know that they're gonna to have to be a partner with us. So I'm interested to know more about, as we move forward, not into the process, but what can the state offer us in terms of examples? What's the rest of the state doing? I think this is a regional issue because what's Sand City and Seaside going to be doing? How impacted is Pacific Grove? Um, it's not all of the waterfront and Cannery Row is a little bit less, but the, the low point of the bay. So I'm interested to see how collectively we see the state and the region start to really identify these things as it gets more solidified, solidified with information science and no, more data. And is that in two years? Is that in five years? Is that in 20 years? I don't know. But I think we do need to approach this from a regional standpoint because we can do certain things, but does that mean that we, uh, we cause the water to have an effect to one of our neighbors or do we move this, do we cause the sand to start to impact? So the unintended consequences of the movement, we've seen that with the CMEX plant and now a CMEX plant is, is closing and uh, there's more sand that's moving in a different way. 
it's a little too early to really know what the impacts are going to be. Um, so I'm not into the construction mode yet. When I look at, you know, arming or build over and uh, go through a neighborhood, I, I just, I can't imagine retreating and abandoning neighborhoods. Uh, we had many callers tonight and I wanna recognize the fact that they have real concerns about the value of their property. Millions and millions and millions of dollars would be impacted on personal property, residences and businesses if we start to talk about just retreating to allow a new ocean front, ocean line that we, we see opportunities there. So I'm really, really hesitant to say that sounds attractive to me. What sounds attractive to me is to be able to tell the citizens that live in the affected areas that we want to work to make sure that we don't lose their properties, that we can hold the ocean back if humanly possible. And that would be my priority is to uh, not retreat, not see abandonment of our neighborhoods and our properties. And although many of us, maybe Tyler, uh, you're, you're in your thirties, maybe you'll see this, but we won't see this, but I don't want to see a cascading nervousness among our residents that all of a sudden start thinking about, well, the city's going to come take our properties and in five years, something's going to happen. I just want to say that's the, the least of what I want to do. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not a big fan of retreating and abandoning, uh, folks that have got invested in this community. Um, Let's see, the, the last comment I had was uh, the beach nourishment. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about that before. The city's actually written a couple of letters to uh, the sanctuary committee uh, or the sanctuary uh, NOAA, and they're still working on their management plan that will be for five years. It's not finalized. They've been working on it for five years. I'm no longer on the sanctuary advisory Council, but I know that they're grinding through the details of the new management plan that has a good compromise that affects the ability to start doing some beach nourishment. So I look forward to seeing how that's going to play out uh, under the new management plan. And the one last thing is another option. Um, I talked about it before, and that's an additional um, outlying uh, breakwater. Uh, we have one that's, you know, on the inlet that is from the Coast Guard Pier to Wharf One. I'm just wondering if there is a, a series of breakwaters that might enable us in the future to look at options to protect uh, the condos that are on La Playa, as well as to uh, save some of our shores and hold back some of the threat from tsunamis and rising tides. So looking forward to you know some conversations about uh, additional uh, uh, breakwater that that might play into this as an effect. So lots of things that we'll be talking about in the future. Look forward to future studies and thank you staff and presenters. Oh, very good. Uh, as, as you are, and I am in agreement with everyone, and as you were thinking, this is one study to my thinking that should be part of many other studies that we have to do. We, we really need to get serious. For example, plastic pollution. We have plastic in our cells, all of us. We have a, we thought our, our bay was a pure, but we have a, a microplastics. Every time someone washes polyester, you get micro uh, fossil fuels in the ocean. So we have to look at that. We have to look at recycling. We know that recycling has collapsed throughout the world. And then think about uh, people of uh, le least, uh, the least economic advantage, people who live next to the worst pollution sites. I think there could be a really good study done on that. And when you talked about levees earlier, I was thinking about New Orleans where you can live in a a neighborhood and you look up 20 feet above your head and that's the Mississippi River. And because of the, the uh, Mississippi has been channeled like that, it's uh, destroyed the barrier islands, which were hurricane buffers. So we need to do a study about that. The loss of the coral reefs and the carbonization of the oceans. The wildfires, the hurricanes, am I cheering you up? Species extension, as Lorna mentioned, also sharks are 
just saw that the sharks uh, are 70% reduction. So what I'm saying is this was a good study and I'm hoping that this will stimulate other studies that hit all of the problems. And if you take a look at what the main problem is, it's climate warming. Tyler mentioned it. Climate warming, as Jerry Brown has said, as our president has said, is the existential challenge of our time. And we can do a lot of the things that I've just listed, but unless we stop climate warming and get off fossil fuels, our future is very, very bleak. And that's another study that has to be done. Let's look at the cause. We're trying to come up with solutions and to, to consequences, but we have to look at the cause. And that's climate warming, and that's a dependence on fossil fuels. So anyway, <laughs> I share that with you and look forward. We're a small city, but maybe we can tackle some of these things. Lead the way. And that's what I'm thinking. In fact, I was talking to a, a neighboring mayor and she said, uh, you have a climate, uh, you have a, a transportation climate study. We'd love to have one of those. And, and you've done a, a study on the impacts of climate and uh, transport, et cetera. Very excited. So we can lead the way in a regional manner, I hope. And so I think unless there's other comments, the action would be to ad adopt the resolution which accepts the report. I'll move, move approval. Make that. I'll second that. Okay. Roll call, please. I heard Alan for first and second. Who else moved? Uh, <laughs> Tyler. Tyler did. Thank you. Um, well, you know, Alan likes to keep the move the meetings moving along. <laughs> likes to keep me guessing. Guilty as charged. Councilmember Albert. Yes. Councilmember Smith. Yes. Councilmember Hoffa. Yes. Councilmember Williamson. Yes. And Mayor Roberson. Uh, yes. And once again, thank you for the stimulating discussion and the excellent report and to Fernanda and our consultants. So we're to council comments. Tyler, you want to start us off today? I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that we're getting into Black History Month uh, yes. as of yesterday. And, and, and I, I mainly only highlight it because of the the feeling of how this is a different uh, Black History Month than I think um, any any recent ones that we've had. So just uh, asking everybody to take a little bit of time to appreciate the the history um, that that uh, the successes of, of the Black community, but all the work that still needs to be done, um, and and the contributions that have contributed to the American culture. So just wanted to give that acknowledgement. Thank you. Ed, council comments? Uh, yeah, just a couple. Um, just wanted to um, say yesterday, uh, virtually attended the Transportation Authority uh, rail meeting. Uh, that is the first of every, first Monday of every month. And we've moved our times to 2 p.m. instead of 3 p.m. to accommodate some of our other board members that are attending uh, COVID update meetings. So the TAMSI rail, uh, studies that we've been looking at and the kickstart project in Salinas is uh, winding down with its construction. Tyler, you talked about rail. So I think it's probably gonna be time in the next month or two to uh, ask uh, Debbie Hale if it's time to give us an update on the rail. And we need to long-term start factoring in, and this is five years, 10 years or longer, um, where we think the uh, potential rail coming to the peninsula should end. Given the fact that we had our report tonight with sea level rise and talking about transportation, I think uh, the next couple months it'd be appropriate to get an update from uh, transportation on rail. Um, and then tomorrow we have the executive committee for transportation. So everything transportation this week, it's all good. Thank you, that's all I had. Excellent, uh, Dan, uh, Council Member Dan, Council comments? Yeah, I just have uh, one comment. Uh, I wanted to comment on an article in the paper about um, some of the trash that's been on um, mm. as you go up Highway 1. And, uh, and and I'm sure it's more than just trash on Highway 1. It's, it's uh, throughout our community. And again, it's probably mostly plastic, Clyde, but that's besides the point. And that um, 
I, I really would like to see the city at least put some pressure. And I know that our city manager has done that with uh, Cal, Caltrans to clean up our, our highways. And I know the reason I mentioned that is because a couple of uh, my neighbors have talked about how much pride they have in our city and that that is um, an area where people drive in to the city of Monterey and that's usually the first thing they see. And um, it would be nice to, to see if we could uh, do something about that. And, and I know Hans is, has worked with Caltrans to, to try to eliminate some of that trash. But um, on top of that, once um, our, our situation with COVID goes away, um, we're hoping, I hope that we could have uh, uh, more of community involvement in just cleaning up parks, cleaning up roadways, and, and helping uh, keep our, our city beautiful as it, it already is. So uh, hopefully that would happen when, uh, when more people can feel more comfortable about, uh, about volunteering their time to keep our city clean. That was it. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Council Member Allen? Um, yeah, great comments um, from everyone. Um, I just wanted to let council know I attended the Monterey Vista Neighborhood Association meeting this Monday night, mm -hmm. and there was a presentation from the uh, Skyline Neighborhood Association um, about the problem of basically tra traffic safety at the intersection of Highway 68 and Skyline. And I think we're all somewhat aware of that. Um, and it seems to me it is a problem that is worthy of, of our city's attention, uh, even though it's not our technical um, jurisdiction, it's Caltrans. I think that it's something that we should look at. Um, some of the neighborhood neighbors seem really intent on the idea of a traffic light as a solution. And um, it seems to me that if this were in the city of Monterey, the first thing we would do is a traffic study and we'd look at, you know, various solutions, which might be a traffic light, might be a roundabout. Some folks don't think there's pos enough room. I tend to think that there is because it would only be a three way roundabout. So it wouldn't be nearly as big as the one that, that we already have on Highway 68 um, or possibly warning lights to kind of get people um, slowing down a little bit as they approach that to, uh, you know, maybe increase traffic enforcement. I don't know what all the possible solutions are, but I do think it's something that we need to um, pay attention to and, um, and perhaps we could collectively um, help get some traction there with Caltrans on what really would be a solution that would work for the whole city. Um, so I won't say any more about the different options that that might work, but just wanted to let you know that is an issue that's brewing and I think we uh, we need to engage. Oh, good. All right. Thank you so much. And let me share here. I'm going to go. I won't share my screen. I'll spare you, but I want to. Okay. <laughs> So I, uh, I, I was appointed by our six peninsula mayors who were within the water management district boundaries as the mayor's representative on the board. You may either give me condolences or congratulations as you see fit. And my idea there is to rotate that seat every couple of years like we do the community coast community power, central coast community power just so we have a broad imp input. So I've been to two meetings. The first one was a, included a dis the fact that our water district, all of us face a thousand acre foot reduction under the CDO by the State Water Resources Control Board. And the water management district has written a letter explaining that all of these factors are beyond our control, <clears throat> excuse me, and asking for relief. There has been no ASR, that's aqua, aquifer storage and uh, renewal. In other words, extra Carmel River water, because we haven't had any rain. But because of the last rain, the district has started pumping into the seaside basin. It can be up to a thousand or more acre feet a year. So it's really an important resource. 
there was a report about pure water Monterey four wells are functioning. I, I'm sure Tyler can tell more about this 755 acre feet has been injected so far. The uh, water district completed a chemical treatment plant and that's paid for by a property tax assessment that was established when the water district was started. I had forgotten that. The Department of Defense, which includes the Navy, Army, and the Coast Guard, has been designated as a jurisdiction of its own. And they have water credits that they've accrued. So going forward, if they have a project on their bases, they would be able to go directly to the water district and not through the city of Monterey. City of Monterey supported that because this isn't new water. It's not water that's being taken out of the city of Monterey's allocation. This is water that has been saved by the various bases that are so important to our city. There was a discussion about supporting an additional parallel pipe, but to uh, Pure Water Monterey or Monterey One Water, which is looking at it right now. So. Again, Tyler can update you on that. There may be uh, some shift of votes on Monterey One Water. So the water board decided at this point not to explore building a pipe that may be built as part of the Monterey One Pure Water Monterey expansion. And the public acquisition of the Cal Am system is in process and it's going to be going to LAFCO. LAFCO has to approve the water district as through public necessity as an agency with the power to sell water. So we're looking at maybe at the end of the year actually having some resolution on whether public ownership is feasible or not. So I will, I'll, I'll send this uh, to the city manager and he can distribute it. But I wanna just update you on what's going on in the water district. So thanks. I don't know if, uh, uh, Council Member Tyler wanted to jump in at all about that parallel pipe or the expansion, the status of uh, pure water expansion or not? Yeah, no, um, uh, you know, the, the, I think you covered it well. I think the only thing I'll add in regards to the expansion is I, I've been in conversation with staff about it. And um, if we were to bring it back, um, there's an option for us to consider um, having additional work done to the SCIR um, just because for several reasons, but one main reason being that because we were doing these two additional deep wells, um, that, that that changes the conditions a little bit. If, if anything, in my opinion, it's, it's for the better because it allows for additional capacity, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. I think it's an important element that we might want to consider. So uh, those are part of the discussions right now, but nothing has uh, been moved forward at this point. So I, I can provide updates as that moves along. Okay, good, thanks. I think it requires a certification of the EIR. And, and Mayor, if I may, just because you were identifying the military bases, I was doing some research, like so I could be wrong here, but I, I was doing some research and I found that the, the, the water supply from the Carmel River, the whole reason why that started was because of the 17 mile drive in, in Hotel Del Monte. So it's interesting how this all came to be yeah. and, and mm -hmm. you, you were mm -hmm. sharing how they have the water credits now that don't have to go through the city. So I just thought that was a fun fact to throw out there. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, we'll go to uh, city manager reports. And yes, I did get the pun and the reference to uh, the EDD, by the way. That was a good one. That's about $30 billion that we could use for coastal protection. Uh, <laughs> the um, uh, We're celebrating uh, Black History Month uh, by having uh, um, uh, exhibit about uh, and sharing information about the Buffalo Soldiers that were present here in our community, as, uh, specifically at the Presidio uh, of Monterey. The library and our museum uh, will conduct some uh, more public outreach to let people know what's going on there. Also, we, we are sharing um, a webinar that was hosted by the National Steinbeck Center, which actually covered the visit of Dr. Martin Luther King to the Monterey Peninsula when he visited uh, Monterey and, and Seaside. And actually uh, during that visit, he stayed in the city of Monterey. So, so we are sharing that webinar also in uh, recognition of uh, Black History Month. 
Um, we have issued, I think, our fourth edition of the Healthy Eating and Active Living Annual Report. Uh, the city joined in 2017 uh, this uh, very important initiative so with about 180 other cities. Um, this uh, special edition that you will find also uh, sent to you in, uh, in PDF form soon, uh, probably on Friday. Uh, was developed by a um, very talented volunteer together with our uh, public outreach uh, team uh, with Laurie Huelga. The volunteer was Alexa Ortiz and you will see that this is a very visual pleasing uh, edition of our 2020 report. Um, uh, Councilmember Albert, thank you for, for bringing up the, uh, the topic of highway cleaning. We have a meeting scheduled, the mayor and I, for February 11th with the District 5 Director of Caltrans. Uh, the, the cleanliness falls under their supervision. Uh, we have two other staffers from Caltrans that will join us and uh, that will be a face, a virtual face-to-face -face meeting with the Director of Caltrans. There are not a lot of Caltrans directors, so that's a pretty high level meeting. And uh, we will um, express our concerns and also learn from, from his side what, what his challenges are. So that will be a productive meeting. Again, that will be on um, uh, February 11th. And last but not least, very important, this Thursday at four o'clock, our library is hosting um, uh, um, a meeting in which they, uh, uh, the library director and the chair of the library board, as well as the chair of the library foundation will, will talk about the state of the library and the future of the library and their visions that they foresee for the next couple of years. So that will be this Thursday at uh, February the 4th at 4 p.m. in our library. And that's it, Mr. Mayor. That's great, lots of good things going on. Well, and, and with appreciation to uh, the, the really great thoughtfulness that we've had and also going forward, rolling up our sleeves to be the, the little city that is willing to take on big problems and lead the way, we're adjourned. Good, everybody. Good, everybody. Bye. Bye.